Hello everyone, hello, hello. Hi there. Oh my goodness. So, uh, yeah, just for anyone who's not in the loop or those kind of listening in audio-only mode who don't have to deal with all the, the chaos and the anarchy, um, yeah, that's right, I'm starting on time, by the way, for once. Actually, I started fractionally before time. Uh, uh, yeah, the uh, internet disintegrated in the estate where I live, where we we have kind of a, this weird sort of unique fibre setup because of the I live in a sort of an eco-build area. And uh, yeah, it collapsed in, in on itself and it only came back to life while I was speaking to Ella. Ella, hello to Ella, big shout out, uh, one of the Rail Natter heroes. Um, and uh, yes, uh, Ella and I were planning on, on, a, on a contingency plan that was actually not, not too bad. It probably would have held up all right. Um, but uh, then it popped back into life magically about, yeah, about 25 minutes ago. So, um, yes. Oh, Josephine, good question. Is the is the TRU funding announced today instead of, or uh, rather than on top of the previous funding announced? We'll cover that in the news. Very, uh, very good point. Right, so, hello everyone. Um, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, let's crack on, because good grief, there's going to be much to cover because, of course, we are going to be talking about the William Shapps plan for rail, uh, or as I like to call it, the William Shapps revival. Uh, sensational prog rock band from 1972. Uh, you know, crim there was Crimson, King Crimson. Uh, you had, you know, early Floyd, and then you had the William Shapps revival. In any case, uh, there they are, plodding along, looking cheerful, is Keith and Grant. Anyway, let's leave them to it. Right, anyway. We are going to, uh, what are we going to do? I'm going to press this button, and I'm going to press this button, and we're going to, first of all, talk about our, before we before we get into the news, we're going to talk about uh, the the COVID-19 ridership. What's going on? What is going on? Well, first of all, let me pull out my Wacom. There we are. Professional as ever. Uh, so, what is going on? Uh, we have, uh, well, it's kind of, the, we've, we've picked up a kind of a fairly steady sort of gradient of, of, of kind of ridership increase uh, here um, uh, for, for kind of rail. So there's rail. Obviously, rail is always a week behind. There's a week of kind of provisional stats. And I leave the provisional stats on so you can kind of compare what the prediction looks like compared to the, the real number. Uh, bus numbers are starting to... Basically, bus numbers have been flatlining for quite a while now. They've just been flatlining at um, uh, around about 60% of pre-COVID levels, which is quite interesting. I wonder if that's just because of because they've reached the limit of available uh, socially distanced capacity, maybe? I don't know. Uh, certainly, you know, we haven't had a... Maybe, I would have expected that to have changed, continued climbing. I think rail is reaching that point too. Having travelled by rail quite a lot over the last four or five days, um, it's pretty clear to me that trains are... Certainly long-distance trains are full. They are as full as they can be without breaching the current and frankly, hopelessly behind rules about social distancing in public transport. That needs to be updated, frankly, because the railways are now, they're reaching their maximum capacity of, so that the, the numbers are, are around about, we're around about 45% here. This is this 45% might end up being a bit higher. I think around the 45 to 55% area. So kind of this, this sort of band here, uh, this, this band is probably what the railway's capacity currently is, what the railway's actual running capacity is. Um, Yes. So, DFT, hurry up and change your guidance to allow more people to fit in trains. Anyway, uh, oh, also I put up the I put up the overall picture as well. I've kind of updated the start of pandemic to to now picture so you can see what's going on. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean we're we're higher. Basically, rail usage is is kind of higher than it has been at any point, kind of through the pandemic. Um, Lots of little birdies are telling me kind of the things that I think I'm saying here, as in, you know, ridership is reaching, uh, you know, it's reaching the buffer stop in terms of how much higher it can get without rail releasing, you know, basically either we run double the number of trains or we need to relax the regulations about social distancing in trains and also get rid of mandatory reservations. These are things that, that without that, we're going to be stuck. But um, ridership is very much on the up. So that's that. What else am I going to talk about? The news. Uh, yes, Josephine, to answer your question, essentially. Um, there. So this, this is a bit of a weird one. So I, I've taken the two images I used when I moaned about this on Twitter earlier today. There's an announcement today about new, inverted commas, funding for 
um, for some rail stuff. So it's a bit of Transpennine, a bit of uh, a bit of Oxford, uh, also the the Devon that new Devon station. And does it, to all I can as far as I can tell, almost everything that they've announced there is not only is it appear to be a reduction in uh, in funding because as you'll notice from this older BBC article, there's the 401. Uh, and then this is transparent and gets 600 million and all the thing there's no detail in this in this kind of announcement about what's really included they just talk broadly about electrification between church fenton and york which by the way is mostly finished so i don't know what on earth they're talking about um as, as far as i'm concerned and no one's provided any evidence to the contrary what this news actually represents is a cut in funding because previously tru was getting 580, it was 589 million, 589 million. There we are. I don't know why I need to draw that, but it's fun to draw things, right? It's fun to draw. Um, 589 million. Now it's getting a slice of 401 million. Uh, so new funding has not been announced. This is a cut. This is, as far as I can tell, a cut in funding. I've seen no evidence to the contrary. So if you have evidence to the contrary, DFT, if you're watching, I, I, it'd be great if it is new funding. I, I shall happily say I was wrong about this. Um, uh, it was actually new funding, and I'll mention it in Real Matter. And I'll, but I, zero evidence thus far forthcoming. Anyway, uh, yes, indeed, Gareth Williams. I expect detail from a government of headlines and three-word slogans. I don't mind a good three-word slogan. Anyway, right, that's that news. Very short news because we're here to talk about Great British Railways. Uh, this is so far the best uh, logo uh, I've seen. Uh, obviously, it's mine. Uh, I quite like this. It's got it's it's, it's the tine looking kind of grand and it kind of nicely balanced and anyway. So we're going to talk about Great British Railways, uh, and it's going to happen. I'm going to get to basically get immediately get stuck in. I'm going to get rid of the Wacom because I don't need that for the rest of the rest of the episode. Um, bye bye Wacom. Uh, so let's do this thing. Um, everyone, thanks for joining. There are a hundred of you watching already. Um, welcome to tonight's. Rail Natter! Uh, as the Intercity 225 fades away. Here it is. This is the this is it. Great British Railways, the Williams Shaps plan for rail. Uh, so they've got they, they've reused the old Williams Rail Review logo and then shoved Department Defa- for Transport on it. Now, um, my miniaturised face is about to appear in the top corner. Hi everyone. Um, so first, I mean, there's there's lots. This is huge, and there's so much underneath this, like between the lines, you know, hidden by the covers, whatever you want to call it. There's a lot at stake and there's a lot going on behind the scenes the fact that grant shaps I, I buy i very much buy into um uh john bull off of the twitters you know london reconnections editor uh garius on twitter in fact uh, i buy into garius's logic of the fact that the fact that grant shaps putting his name on this is a good thing the fact that he has done this actually does mean that it does increase the likelihood it happens. It does, you know, when was the last time that a minister put their name against a major review? They always pay someone else or, or you know, uh, basically fob someone else off to have their name against it. You know, Hendy, for example, Okavy. This time, Shaps has actually put his name on it. And that means that, that means that it might happen. It means that it might end up being delivered. And frankly, that would be a good thing because broadly, this document uh, we're going to go through it in fine toothcomb detail, or reasonably good de- uh, fine detail. This document is mostly good. There's a lot of very good stuff in it, and when I say very good, I mean the stuff that anyone who's vaguely sensible has been saying needs to happen for a very long time. No, it does not mean nationalisation. The railways have not been nationalised, but as I often argue, there's no such thing as nationalisation anymore. Yes, it probably would be. A little bit more useful if you could, if if you, know, you basically get rid of that need for a concession and just make it properly state-owned, but actually that represents such a minimal difference. It's it's a, of trivial importance uh, compared to other stuff. Now we're gonna. I am gonna unpick. Oh, actually, I should have got my. Wait a minute. I will get my book out just a sec. Because I'm gonna scribble down kind of key points and highlights as we go through, so that I can come back to them. Uh, 
Yeah, that's right. I'm going to be broadly, I'm going to be vaguely organized, says the guy, reaching down into his uh, bag. I've got a pencil. I've got my orange book. There we are, my orange book. Um, I am going to scribble down things that I can then talk about and kind of we can review again in the next episode, uh, kind of as a bit of a round off of what's been going on. But uh, what the plan is, is that we're going to work through these, the, the kind of this, work through the document this episode. And we're not going to finish the whole thing, not at all. Um, and we're going to, and there are a few things I've already tweeted out a little bit about a little bit that, that, that have annoyed me or, or are fundamentally missing. Uh, one of them is. Uh, the Roscoe's, the Rolling Stock Operating Companies, they hardly get a mention, and the plan is to just leave them exactly as they are. That's a that's a screw up, because they are the main way that money is leached out of the industry for no for no discernible benefit. Um, now, number one, number two is uh, uh, about uh, branding, uh, about devolved branding. I think you saw my thread on that, and likewise, level boarding. I, I kind of did a two part thread: level boarding, the other element. Level boarding doesn't get a single mention in this document, which is really, really poor show. So I've already got some slides associated with that, which is basically a, a bit of a play on that. You know, it's basically my thread, but in video form for those of you who don't care for Twitter threads. But we'll do that next week because this is a two parter, as you know. So I'm, I've got my book in front of me, so I can scribble. If I do, remi- if I say something grand, remind me to write it down. You're all. You know what the you know what the deal is. You're all there anyway. So, this document is broken down into was it eight chapters, something like that. Uh, we're gonna go kind of so that so chapter one is kind of like a bit of an outline of okay the railways since privatization, kind of what's happened, and they you know they don't admit they they say that it's a bit of a mess, but they don't they don't you know admit that it was their ideology that resulted in that mess being created. But anyway, um, and actually they do talk about things pre privatization as well. Well, they allude anyway. Yeah, we'll we'll cover that. Chapter two, commitment to rail. Uh, this is sort of a, a, a useful chapter because they are saying we're not going to cut things, but this needs to be seen and and this contextualizes the whole document. This needs to be seen in the light in light of the fact that they are pushing for cuts. We, Network Rail are being told to reduce headcount by as much as, if not more than twenty percent. Funding is being cut to, you know, the the, the broad funding package for rails be, is being cut. Capital expenditure. Is, is is bouncing around and being reduced. You know, capital expenditure away from HS2 is being reduced. Uh, they're, they're now deliberately quoting HS2 as part of the overall rail expenditure, which is disingenuous and actually plays into the people who said, oh, HS2 will take funding away from the, the, the railways. Well, that, that isn't how it works, and no, it won't, except that they you, it's hard to argue with that when, you know, funding to the existing network is being wound down. That's not related to HS2. It's because of... Uh, general intransigence towards the rail network uh, by the current government. So, by the way, the previous government were no better. It's worth always pointing out how little use new labour were absolutely useless when it came to the, the rail network. Absolutely useless. So, it's just kind of blue, blue or red, all hopeless. Uh, so that's top, so that's an interesting and, and, and important chapter we'll pick through. Chapter three. This is where they. So this is kind of the meat uh, of the of the piece. Uh, chapter three. Well, kind of chapter three to chapter six. These. Uh, this is talking about what they're going to do, or to eight, sorry. This is talking about what they're going to do. So chapter three is integrating the railways. They're talking about how they're going to do that. Chapter four is talking about what will replace franchising. Uh, chapter five, you'll note, by the way, that I wrote right back at the start of lockdown when the emergency, everything went into special measures or emergency measures and all those emergency contracts were handed out. I said that that was the end of franchising. Um, sometimes I predict things that are not, that are right and aren't horrible, like, you know, not predicting rail crashes. This time it was something that is useful to 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 go down. Oh, bye, Heel. Um. Uh, anyway, so uh, chapter five: a new deal for passengers. This is talking about the passenger experience. So ticketing, uh, accessibility is mentioned. Uh, a few other bits and pieces in there. Uh, chapter six: this is the most bollocksy chapter because it's just like this is essentially to. It's almost been thrown in there by the by the conservative party hq to make sure that they're ta- that it's like we have a whole chapter dedicated to private sector involvement when actually for the most part this is just a meaningless chapter that, that doesn't say anything and, I, and I, in, in some ways it, it almost reinforces the fact that this is um democratizing the involvement of capital uh so this is a bit of a nonsense chapter uh we'll go through it chapter seven uh, accelerating innovation and modernization this is again a bit of a nonsense chapter because this is what this should be talking about is what's the next one yeah so this one really should be talking about decarbonisation but actually like no innovation modernisation again a bit of a nonsense chapter chapter eight uh, empowering rails people yeah it's interesting to see what uh, mm, this is an interesting one and i'm there again there there are things that are missing in this i think so um 
Ella, I'm not going to say that word. No, you're not getting the uh, you're not getting the bingo point. So, uh, empowering rails people. We'll see what comes out of that. Anyway, right. So that's it. Eight chapters, and we're going to go through every we're going to go through every single one of them, but possibly not tonight because tonight we are going to wrap up fairly sharp because I don't want this to be insanely long. I need and ideally I am going to make rail matters, particularly ones where it's just me within an hour because then more people will be able to watch them. So all 125 of you who are watching, let's do this thing. So. Here it is. Great British Railways. This is the report. You can see my mouse so I can wiggle around things. Hopefully that's nice and clear. Um, uh, I'll just give a warning. This I keep forgetting to do so. I'll just give a warning um, that sometimes I might flick pages quickly and it might result in flicker. So if you're photosensitive and you think that's an issue, um, maybe this isn't... Yeah. Maybe if you've got a way of coping with that or, or you know, uh, I'll, I'll, tr I'll try and avoid too rapidly flicking through pages by not using the scroll wheel and using the arrow keys. But there's a, there's a risk that I might kind of flick through a few pages and it might be a bit flickery. So just just as a bit of a warning. Um, so we're going to do it. We're going to have a look. The first page has a British flag on it, uh, but it's quite small. So we'll we'll let that pass. But I, I, I want someone on screen uh on screen i want someone in the chat to be counting uh appearances of the flag because actually i don't think there are that many anyway right here we go so uh okay first first written paragraph this publication is the first to use the new typeface rail alphabet 2 this is a continuation evolution of margaret calvert and jock Kinnear's original rail alphabet typeface which was employed across the rail network from the mid-1960s margaret calvert has collaborated with designer henrik kubel uh, to develop Rail Alphabet 2, it retains the overall proportions of the original, but letters are sharper and slightly more compact for maximum legibility. It kind of also slightly improved for the digital age as well. Um, Great British Railways will introduce Rail Alphabet 2 across the rail network, replacing the many different fonts used on railway signage. Rail Alphabet 2 is used for the headings throughout this document. There you go. So they open with a branding thing, which uh, I'm at peace with because I'm a big fan of branding. Branding is, 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 is it's, it's not only nice, but it's very, very important too. So there we go. And here's the more boring front page of the white paper. So let's, uh, it's all OGL licensed, so that means it's fine for me to go through it and critique it. Here's the contents page, which we've kind of already gone through. Yeah, there's a conclusion at the end as well, obviously. But uh, delivering the rail revolution, it's not, okay, it's, it's worth pointing out. This is not a revolutionary document. This is not radical. This is very much an evolution. This is not, there are not huge drastic changes here. Closer working between the train operating companies and Network Rail had already been well advanced. This is quite a natural, gentle next step. It isn't just grand. Anyway, so. Uh, do I just skip the forward? Do I care what these old, old men are saying? Uh, let's, let's skip the forward, because actually, you know what? It doesn't matter what the forward says. It's, it's quite long. It's maybe worth picking out the personal postscript from Keith Williams, that I presume he's written under duress. Uh, I've been ably supported by a panel of six independent experts who have brought invaluable challenge and critical support uh, across a range of topics. Uh, Dick Fern, Tom Harris, Margaret uh, uh, Llewellyn, uh, is actually, uh, I presume it's Llewellyn, but actually spelled Llewellyn, uh, Roger Marsh, Dr. Alice Maynard, and Tony Poulter have given freely of their time, advice, and wisdom. Our work has also benefited from extensive support and advice from leaders and experts across the sector and beyond, including Declan Collier, Sir Peter Hendy, and Steve Montgomery. Um, uh, my thanks are also due to the team at the DFT who supported me, not least Bernadette Kelly, who has let my work run its course and been open to its findings. Uh, no mention of the Treasury there, who probably weren't uh, open to its findings. Uh, yeah, the forward, I'm going to just skip the forward because I don't care what uh, what Grant Shapps has to say. Uh, I'm, I care about the meat in the in the document. So um, these are the, the kind of the, how many? One, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven promises. The, these came out in the, in, in the embargoed email the kind of just before Railnetter happened last week. Um, so these are the four promises. So we've got, we will bring the railways back together, delivering more punctual and reliable services. Okay, well, there's there's two things in that promise, which is, you know, bringing railways back together. Don't really know what that means. And delivering more punctual and reliable services. Okay, fair enough. We'll make the railways easier to use. That's a big promise, but okay. We will rebuild public transport use after the pandemic. That's, I'm glad they've written that down because that is a very important thing to write down. The ambition to grow public transport use is really important. And actually it builds into the fact I'm glad we went through bus back better quite recently because that document shows that there is an aspiration within government to be improving public transport usage and, and broadening the use of public transport. So, um, uh, I yeah, so I'm glad they've expli been explicit about that. And they, they are, they reinforce that explicitness later on, uh, which I'm very pleased about. Um, 
I'm not going to be necessary. Uh, do do at me in if um yeah do keep atting me into the chat by the way if you want me to spot your comments. But I, I might not be sus with this, this is such a detailed thing. I might kind of miss miss a few. So feel free to repost anything. So that's the first three. Uh, you know, more punctual, reliable, easy to use, and rebuilt after the pandemic. We will maintain safe, secure railways for all. So safety and security. Okay, so they they put a thing about safety. Good. We will keep the best elements of the private sector that have helped to derive growth. Interested to know what those are. Uh, we'll see, <laughs> frankly. Uh, they talk about freight already being a nimble, large private sector market. Well, yeah, I mean, to be fair, that's true, but I, it doesn't really make much odds, to be honest. I don't think it operates much more differently to how it would have before. Anyway, uh, we'll make the railways more, you know, arguably with freight, sorry. The, the the issue with the with the disconnect, the fact that freight is private, is that the only things that makes that, that make financial sense for the private sector to invest in are freight depots and terminals. There's no financial the costs of capital expenditure on the infrastructure are way too high for the actual private freight operators to invest in them. So they require a strategic view, which means that freight continues to get forgotten, you know, gauge enhancement and, and in fact electrification as well. So I don't know. That doesn't sound like it's actually you know, the the thing that makes them good is not that they're private sector to my mind. Anyway. We'll make the railways more efficient. Well, that sounds nice. What does it mean? Because everyone is always wanting to make the railways more efficient. But by what metrics do you mean? Do you mean you're going to make the steel on steel wheel rail interface better? Because I don't think so. That's about as efficient as it can be. What do you mean by that? So what they, they're saying, what they mean is, what they actually mean, as, as we'll dig into, is fewer staff. Because uh, that's the only way you drive efficiency in an organization is by shrinking it. Uh, anyway, so we'll see what that actually means. There are some things that are, if they mean financial efficiency, yeah, well, yeah, we'll see. But actually, anyway, so we'll pick we'll pick into that later. Uh, then and then the last of their promises: we want to grow, not shrink the network. Uh, where's that beach in Claxon? Uh, we're investing tens of billions of pounds in new lines, trains, services, and electrification. Uh, it's interesting they mention electrification there because uh, at the moment they ain't investing tens of billions of pounds in electrification. They ain't in investing a single billion of pound in electrification. At a time of deep challenge for public transport, uh, increasing flexibility and productivity will secure the future of the railways and the jobs of those who are working right across Britain. Hmm. Right, anyway, let's get cracking into the chapters. I have water and I intend to drink it. So, um, yeah, so... Chapter one, the railway since prime. I could read it like uh, like I'm reading an audiobook. Chapter one, the railway since privatisation. Uh, anyway, I don't know. Uh, in many ways, Britain's railways improved dramatically under privatisation, and that's all they say to evidence that zero. Ever, what do they mean by in many ways? Which ways? On the eve, basically to save ridership. On the eve of the pandemic, the railways ran over twenty one thousand services on an average day, a third more than before privatisation. Yeah. As ever, this is a correlation, not causation situation. The flag count is still only one. Yeah, I know, right? Um, government invested, investment has quadrupled since privatisation. I love that. In many ways, Britain's railways improved dramatically under privatisation. No, no, no. You mean during privatisation because government investment has quadrupled and that's why the railways have, have increased ridership is because government investment in them has increased by an order of magnitude. Not nearly. Anyway, you know, recent years have seen around a billion pounds a year invested by the private sector. Mm. Yeah, n n not really, because that's just upfront investment that we then, as tax and fare payers, pay for in lease fees of rolling stock. So mm, that's bollocks. But anyway, public funding with five-year capital settlements is more certain and predictable than the stop-start regime imposed on British Rail. That's true, except that the capital expenditure has been pulled out of that five-year cycle. So, hmm, hmm. Anyway, we're off to a great start, basically. Uh, I shouldn't get too angry about all these hi historical hijackings and, and rewritings of history. So uh, the assumption of a network and inevitable decline has ended. Yep, that's true. Uh, thousands of, so basically, I, I need to not dwell on this. This is this is all the spiel and the bump, right? So they're talking about, pand they're, they're talking about you know, uh, in 2019, rail travel achieved its highest share of all miles travelled in Great Britain since 1967. Yeah, so, so that's basically a clawing back of modal share um, from the railways, and that's obviously been decimated by the pandemic. And they'll refer to on the eve of the pandemic quite a lot. They say on the eve of the pandemic twice in this, which I presume is, if, if I do a search of on the eve, in fact, can I do, uh, eve of the pandemic 
Oh, no, it's just twice, but it's on this page. There we go, anyway. Um, anything else you want me to search for, by the way, we'll get there, and I shall do some searching. Um, there we are. If it, Matt Reed, if you put this on Audible, I would listen to it. What, me turning this into just me reading the William Shapps plan for real? That's a bizarre request, and one that we can pop in the Discord, because that sounds surreal, but actually could be quite entertaining. Anyway, right, okay, so it's a long old thing, you know. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that the idea of that is is quite funny. What voice would I do it in? Do I, would I do like a Tarrant or a, like a yeah? I don't know. Anyway, rail freight being transformed, diversification of coal and steel into pro yeah. So they're they're doing lots of like correlation, not causation stuff. There are significant successes for which the privatized railways do not get enough credit. Oh, these are significant successes for which privatized railways do not get enough. That's because it was nothing to do with privatization. Ugh. Anyway. We should not romanticise the nationalised era. So this is basically them saying, no, it's not nationalisation, We're not. We're, it's not state. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but unlike most privatisations, that of the railways has never become publicly accepted because its failings have remained all too obvious. Right? Breaking British Rail into dozens of pieces was meant to foster competition between them and, together with the involvement of the private sector, was supposed to bring greater efficiency and innovation. Uh, little of this has happened. Instead, the fragmentation of the network has made it more confusing for passengers and more difficult and expensive to perform the essentially collaborative task of running trains on time. Yes. So you can see you can see that they had to pallet this for the Treasury and for the CCHQ. Um, so that's why they said we shouldn't romanticise the nationalised era. Which, to be fair, I actually do agree with that sentence. We should not romanticise the nationalised era. It's not wrong. But it's not... But for the same reasons that privatisation hasn't made our railways good, nationalisation fundamentally didn't make our railways bad. There are bigger things at stake, folks. Um, bigger things are at play. Anyway, so uh, successive governments sought to balance the cost of the rail between tax and fare pairs. Government funding still made up nearly a third of the industry's income. And fares have risen by, risen by 50% since ninety seven. in real terms. Uh, model put in place at privatisation has not done enough to deliver a more cost-efficient sector. And many costs have consistently risen faster than inflation, with taxpayers and customers having to foot the bill. Yep. Uh, lack of innovation and incentive to modernise is partly responsible for this. I mean, flip on the flip side of that, this is all partly responsible for a lack of innovation and incentive, but they haven't written that. Anyway, whilst London's oyster and contactless schemes demonstrated many years ago how a better passenger experience and cost efficiency can come together, more than half of all national rail journeys in Britain still use paper tickets before the pandemic. I quite like paper tickets. As you can see, I've got a pile of them, but where are they? Where, where? I've got a big face momentarily. Where am I? Rotating. Oh yeah, there's a load of them behind my head. Uh, there, you can see them. Yeah, see, there, it's a load of paper tickets. Actually, I've got loads more than that. I just can't find the shoebox that I've got them all in. But anyway, it's kind of by the by, isn't it? Hello, everyone who's uh, saying what on earth is this large-faced man arriving here doing? Anyway, so uh, it's also got very dark in here. I might have to uh, put the light on. Anyway, oh, so bad, private bad, public good. I, I know I'm dwelling on this. I should probably shouldn't dwell on it because it's already half past. Yeah, to see nationalisation as a cure role is to overlook the major role the public sector has already played in the railways for years without so far solving many of the problems. That's actually a really good point. <laughs> it is a fair point that um, you know things weren't perfect when they were when it was uh, owned by the, you know it was public entirely in public ownership. It's a realisation that the picture is more complex. What does in real terms mean in relation to fares? It means in absolute terms, fares have increased even more than that. But in real terms, accounts for um, you know how much everyone's salaries have increased, accounts for inflation, these sorts of things. Um, so, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah, for anyone on here hoping that as a leftist, I would be just shouting and screaming that we should everything should that everything should be nationalised. Well, yeah, I do like the idea of a state of everything being entirely you know just omitting the unnecessary bureaucracy and, and administration of having private you know having the, this concession model, which we'll talk about later. But the reality is it doesn't make much difference. And, and I think people are pulling, people are um, trying to make more of an ideological uh, point rather than a an actual structural and fundamental you know, operational point about the railways when they try and say, oh, it just needs to all be fully nationalised. There, there would be minor benefits to having it entirely state state operated. But fundamentally, the name at the top of the paycheck doesn't make a huge difference to the, to, to the, the way that the railways operate. It's much more about... Uh, strategy and structure than it is about ownership. Having a plan, you know, is the key thing. So, uh, and I agree that, with the, again, with this line, simplification is more important than nationalisation. Yep, that's fine. And they've, they've done lots of stuff here. Um, you know, they talk about... So this is interesting. So 
they, they talk about the fact that Network Rail is state-owned. They said failures at Network Rail were central to the collapse of the timetable in 2018, which originally triggered this review. Well, that's not entirely fair. That's more about the lack of accountability. It's not Network Rail's fault. Uh, lots of infrastructure do, things weren't delivered. But again, those are because of a lack of strategy. This this all comes down to the fact that no matter who is in charge, no, no matter who is ostensibly supposed to be in charge, the buck stops with the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, frankly. Um, despite reform, its costs also remain too high. Well, do they? Why? Against what measure? Why, why, why? How can we say that? Why do we think they are too high? You know, the, the, the Britain's railways are amongst the cheapest to run per passenger head in, in Europe. You know, the, the, the subsidy per passenger is the smallest in, in Britain than it is anywhere else in Europe. You know, I, I, I just that's because we have high fares, by the way. But also it's because yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just, um, yeah, it's just, yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, they're talking about electrification going wrong. Yeah, again, strategic problems. Over specification. Oh, right, here we go. Massive klaxon. Gold plating. No, 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 no. Anything. Let's see how often that appears in this because I hate that. Gold plating is. If anyone mentions gold plating, they are. Yeah, three mentions of the words gold plating. Gold plating is a lazy trope. It is just nonsense. And I know you're saying, oh, he's an engineer. Of course he's going to defend gold plating. No. Why is that? What is the gold plating? What are you referring to? And is it because you have an, a railway that you have no access to maintain? Well, it's not gold plating then, is it? Also, it's capital expenditure, so it doesn't matter. What you're doing is reducing daily expenditure by building a better long-term asset. Just if anyone says gold plating and it, with a sensible face, tell them off. Um, so that's nonsense. Sim so it's, oh yeah, simplification is more important than nationalisation. Yes, fine, agreed. And they're talking about all the dozens of organisations with silos, individual priorities that don't work together, plethora of passenger freight, open access operators, leasing companies. Yeah, it's interesting they say rolling stock leasing companies and then they don't fix that problem later. I wonder if that's a, a, a Keith Williams bit that's been left in. Um, yeah, passenger watchdogs, all these different things, all, all vying, vying for um, their own individual targets that aren't necessarily compatible or, or even adjacent. Um, so... Yeah, it's interesting. The mere number of different players in the sector is not in and of itself the greatest problem, but a symptom and a cause. That's interesting. So here we are. Variety of... Then they're talking about blame culture. So the fact there's no leader or organisation at local, regional, or national levels that has responsibility and accountability for making the whole system work. Absolutely agree. Um, yep, agreed. Uh, so there we are. So this then they talk about Schedule 4 and Schedule 8 and the fact that there are 400 full-time staff known as train delay attributors arguing with each other about whose fault the delay is. Yeah, I agree with the frustration in that wording. It is nonsense. The fact that, the, 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 that this exists as a thing, as a way to allocate blame, is just bonkers. Uh, yeah, completely agree. Adjudications, they're, they're talking about some jokey adjudications here. So, who was responsible for a train being so overcrowded that a passenger fainted, causing delays while they were taken off? And whether a pheasant is a small bird, in which case, according to the principles at the time, the train operator was to blame for a delay caused by hitting one, or a large bird, in which case it's Network Rail's problem. Yeah, this is nonsense stuff, although you can kind of see the point of that, because if it's a small bird, it can fly. If it's a large bird, it can, you know, the, the fence is good anyway. Blah, blah, blah. So it's talking about the, the, the rules. It's talking about the size of franchise agreements, you know, being 1,000 pages. Key train requirements, 200 pages-ish. You know, um, ticketing and settlement, agree settlement agreement, nearly 1,000 pages. So this this is all incredibly complicated. Uh, and some of it re results in, in, in value for the... Uh, Yes, Ella, 400 people, I know. Um, some of it accounts for increase, improving... You know, some of the complexity of our ticketing system means that it is it provides really high value for some people who, who find those, but it results in a lot of other people feeling that it doesn't provide value for them. And I'd argue that there is an, to, sacrificing some of that cheapness for simplicity and accessibility might be worth happening, although um, it might be interesting to consult passengers on that, and no one has yet. Anyway... Uh, the railways in Great Britain. Here we are. It's a nice picture. Uh, so they're saying nice things about the railways. They're, they're accepting some key things. They're, they're accepting the fact that the economically railways are a positive force. They're accepting that it's a societal uh, catalyst for regeneration. It's, it's connecting communities, fosters placemaking, the environment here. So for every mile a person travels, passenger trains produce a third of the emissions of the average petrol car. Yeah, it's actually lower than that in some by some... Methods of calculation, safety, rail is the safest mode of transport, and the UK, rail is the safest mode of land transport, I think. I think uh, flying being quite a lot safer than railways, because 
you know, stats. Um, and the UK has one of the safest railway networks in Europe. Absolutely true. Um, funding. The government has invested $150 billion in the railway since the mid-1990s. Indeed so. Uh, rail makes up more than 50% of all public spending on transport. Also true. Um, here we are. Railways need fundamental change. Well, uh, I don't agree with that. Why do they need fundamental... Is it right that we're fundamentally changing things? No, I don't think railways should ever have fundamental change. Everything goes wrong when you do fundamental change. Fundamental change is what gave us the chaos of the 90s and lots of horrible rail crashes that could have been avoided. So I don't agree with that, even if it is written in RA2. Before COVID, the railways were the busiest they ever have been. Uh, sorry, hopefully I do an obvious I'm reading voice, by the way, when I'm doing the reading. It's, this for audio, it's all right for you watching this who know what's going on, but I try and do it on I'm obviously reading voice when I'm when I'm reading things out so the people on podcast form get when I'm when it's me and when it's uh, I mean I suppose I could do a voice whenever I'm reading, but I'll probably make it, it just get grating, right? Anyway, so there's some stuff here about passenger experience. You know, pricing is confusing. Uh, fewer than half the journeys offer value for money. Passengers find it difficult to get around or a lack of comfortable waiting spaces. Two-thirds of disabled passengers report at least one problem when travelling by rail. That's the euphemism of the century. Good grief. Fundamentally, most trains are not accessible. This is <laughs> this is a key problem. Um, here we are. The rail freight market has transformed from carrying coal to carrying construction and container goods. However, almost nine times as much freight is moved by road. Good grief. That's a painful, uh, painful stat. 87% of the workforce is male. That's also a painful stat. Yes, I'm yawning because I'm quite tired. It's been a long day. Uh, 100 busiest stations catered for half of all passenger journeys. So this is a point of like, you know, there are a huge number of stations that are not well used and that reflects badly on the service. 6% um, of adults travel by train in 2019. That's interesting. Anyway, oh, another point here is the fact that the idea that commuting makes up the majority of, of, of travel. It doesn't. Business travel does not, you know, the business travel is, is, is sort of a pretty nebulous collection of different ways that people move around and if you look at it, so so actually commuting is less than 50 percent of, of overall rail travel so that, that's a really important thing to, to to spot out you can see the uh you can see that the, this is the, the the trend in journeys is not necessarily as useful a measure of of, of growth of railways but anyway it, it's, it's kind of it's a familiar trend it's, it is a very familiar trend so that's a nice graphic uh, they're going to say that, uh, so they've, they've put a nice heading here, a structure that's had its day. Well, yeah, okay. Even before the pandemic, it was clear that this system was no longer viable. Um, such competition as there was had diminished. UK companies were increasingly reluctant to even bid for franchises. Uh, two franchises failed and were taken over by the government's operate last resort. Others were heading the same way. Um, yeah, so this, this is all painting the picture. So, so Williams pointed to six key problems. The rail sector uh, too often loses sight of its customers, both passengers and freight. I'm glad that freight is being mentioned there. Uh, it's missing opportunities to meet the needs of the communities it serves. Yeah, okay. It's fragmented. Accountability is not always clear. Absolutely. The sector lacks clear strategic direction. That's my main drum that I bang. Uh, no plan. Uh, what well, the last two of these six problems? Uh, it needs to become more productive and tackle long-term costs, and it struggles to innovate and adapt. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, existential challenge of... Uh, we've, we've run through uh, COVID enough. We're not going to go through that again. So, uh, so far we're only on one union flag count as well, which is pretty good. Um, so, okay, right. So this is, we're now going to skip in. There's a nice graphic here. How the railways will change for the better. Keith Williams and the government have shared a shared vision for Great Britain's railways that can be summarised in 10 outcomes. Okay, so we, I'm, I'm doing another list. It's always lists, isn't it? Number one, modern passenger experience. Number two, retail revolution. Number three, new way of working with the private sector. Number four, Economic recovery and financially sustainable railways. Ugh. Number five, greater control for local people and places. Number six, cleaner, greener railways. Number seven, a new offer for freight. Number eight, increased speed of delivery and efficient enhancements. Number nine, skilled, innovative workforce. And in at number ten, simpler industry structure. Uh, yeah, there we are. So that's the ten bullet points. And uh, yeah, I think we're gonna. I'm not gonna go through the the subtext of each of these because. We're going to go through each of these in more detail as we go through the rest of the report. So, okay, this is an important chapter. And, um, yeah, what was that? Yes, I know, they had a, a wheelchair user, and yet they don't mention level boarding at all in the report. Uh, yeah, good good point. Oh, spoiler, you will remain at one, says Alistair Ball, with modern, modern passenger experience. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, 
what's my problem? Eddie Owen, what's my problem with the Union flag? Well, I don't specifically have a problem with the Union flag. It's it's what it, more what it represents, uh, and uh, you know the fact that it's used as a as a direct appeal to the base in lieu of actual content and meaningful proposals. Um, yeah. Uh, but if you don't like the fact that I'm disparaging about the Union flag, then it's probably not, yeah, uh, sauce. So, you know, if you'd asked me this in 20... If you asked me in 2013 what I thought of the Union flag, I'd dare say I'd think better of it than I uh, do now post-2016. Anyway, chapter two, our commitment to rail. Why railways matter? Uh, so this is good. I'm glad that they've done a chapter where they're saying, no, no, we do like rail. Promise, promise. So here we go. The pandemic has caused a significant shift away from public transport, from commuting to home working. Okay. Road traffic is almost back to pre-pandemic levels, yes. Uh, some might say that that means our railways matter less. In fact, it means the opposite. Yeah, I agree. I could have written that sentence for play. Uh, the road network in many places already operated at or close to capacity before the pandemic. When full economic life returns, there is a risk that any permanent shift towards the car will cause greater congestion, holding back the economic recovery. This applies especially to cities, the engines of the British economy, and most of all to London, the most productive city in the country. It and many other places cannot function without effective rail services. And across the country, the capacity the railways provide is important to the transport system as a whole. Yeah, absolutely true. So I uh, fully agree with all of that. Nothing I can possibly, uh, yeah, nothing I can possibly disagree with in that. Our railways will play a crucial role as we build back better. Hashtag build back better. Uh, they're already a clean, green transport system for the country. They can support more flexible ways of working, not inhibit them. Absolutely. They will continue to be a catalyst for job creation, investment, prosperity by connecting our towns and cities into regional powerhouses as well as supporting tourism and links to rural communities. Yes, yes, yes to all this. The stages on the government's roadmap to net zero carbon emissions and its commitments on air pollution cannot be met without transport playing its part. I mean, that's a euphemism. Fundamentally, transport is the one thing that is bigger than everything else that needs to be fixed so that's a bit of a yeah bit of a cop-out sentence there but anyway so fulfill their potential the railways must become better at meeting the needs of passengers and freight customers and uh, they must do so now renaissance of rail in this country has only just begun well that's yes i agree with that uh some have argued future major transport investment programs should be paused the government agrees with the national infrastructure commission that this would be a sh would be short-sighted it's about the only good thing that useful thing the national infrastructure commission have said for uh, quite a while but anyway um, so they're talking about emergency revenues, investments, clearly, you know, the, the fact they've spent their 12 billion quid on, which is not very much, by the way, spending 12 billion quid on the railway, um, given that it, you know, it, it folded in on itself because everyone was told to stay at home. Yeah. Um, major investment in its future is also confirmed during the pandemic, you know, contracts for HS2, absolutely. Uh, 2021, we announced more funding for, uh, here we go, Beach and Clatton. Um Yes. Lines closed to passengers under the beaching report. Uh, so that's East West Rail and also the Northumberland line, Northumberland line between Newcastle, Blythe and Ashington, which they're talking about, already thinking about descoping, which is fantastic. Uh, they also done they, they, they've got that line. They're, they're kind of working on the restoring the Oakhampton service. Fine. New lines and stations being opened in Birmingham. Yeah, they're just and re this is a paragraph where they just reannounce all the stuff that is already happening. The government is committed to supporting public transport and connectivity across the whole of the UK. Oh, they're talking about the Hendy connectivity review there. Lovely. Investment in rail is improving the capacity and capability of the network for rail freight. Not that much. UK government is also supporting central rail improvements across Great Britain now. Motherwell, Middlesbrough to direct services from Motherwell and Middlesbrough to London. Middle millions of pounds of funding to improve accessibility of stations. Uh, you know, and, and, and funding to advance plans to upgrade the current signalling to state-of-the-art digital signalling from Shrewsbury to Aberystwyth and Pulselli. What are they referring to there? I don't get that, because that that happened, like, what, 12 years ago? They're not upgrading it again. Oh, that's a bit weird. I don't really know what they're saying there. This is just, like, them listing off the things they can think of. Anyway, right. Forget all that naffness. The, the, the earlier stuff is important. This is an important little box out here. So the geographic scope of this white paper. This white paper and the Williams Rail Review have focused on railways within Great Britain as transport is a devolved area in Northern Ireland. Yeah, okay, and also there's like on a separate island, so it kind of self-contained with, with the, the wider island of Ireland. Uh, the devolved authorities in Scotland and Wales have a range of devolved powers in relation to rail, which they can, will continue to exercise, as will TfL and other metropolitan authorities uh, in relation to rail and light rail in their areas. Right, that, there's, a, there's loads of important stuff in that, in that little paragraph. Um... Firstly, Scotland and Wales. There's the so th this is an, a, them admitting there is not going to be not going to be any change to the existing range of devolved powers. 
it's also important for the metropolitan areas because it makes no sense to then to centralize you know city urban rail operation operating kind of uh, powers uh you know birmingham manchester well we've already talked about this in in my just what structure should the railways have anyway episode i talked about the fact that you've got these kind of large urban areas that deserve to have their own con- control over their own um public transport systems so um yeah so so that's imp- important they pick, pick that out um and now uh, oh right sorry uh, the last paragraph of this box out as now they and great british railways will need to work together to deliver a coordinated network across great britain yeah that's that's true um both wales and, Sc- and scotland they sh- they need more devolved power that wales needs m- needs funding autonomy for its transport but that doesn't mean that the network needs to be cut off from the re- you know the, the, you can't ignore the fact that the the delays that happen in birmingham uh and or in you know york or in even in london impact on services in wales and scotland you know the, the whole network is totally interconnected uh manchester you know delays in manchester impact on scottish and welsh services anyway so that's an important little box out there um so you know the spending review in no- november 2020 committed the you know continued to commit the yeah this is where they've merged hs2 in with so they've got 22.8 billion for hs2 to 2025 and a further 17.5 billion in capital funding for renewals upgrades and enhance from the existing network up to 2024 uh yeah uh but this is important this is saying the the five-year basically the uh, in the future great british railways will develop five-year business plans across both services and infrastructure to inform government funding decisions but what that's basically saying is um that the five-year control periods will continue to be a thing which is good because that at a minimum you need five years ideally they'd be the the longer term plan so that's uh, so they're saying look we 40 billion hooray uh, investment will be prioritized in areas that have seen less spending in the past to level the whole country this is the leveling up agenda that we've seen is nothing but talks so far maybe at some point it'll stop being talks at some you know so um this is an acknowledgement that um a lot of money has gone into southeast england um um and they're saying they're pointing out that London and the Southeast will continue to benefit, but that they're going to step up um, investment in. Do they mention the East Midlands? They don't actually mention the, the areas. They don't mention the Southwest or the East Midlands. But anyway, the government's part, the, partly because that's tactical. They can choose where um, they can they can make their selection as to where they think needs leveling up. Right, pork barrel politics, as we've already seen with Dishy Rishi's investment in his local constituency anyway revenue support for the railways will continue but additional emergency support will not remain indefinitely well that's kind of fair enough they can't continue to you know at some point we have to say actually the pandemic's behind us we're moving on so they're talking about you know oh look at this wonderful revenue support we provided well yeah good but that is because there was a global pandemic it's not the railway's fault um blah 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 five year blah, blah, blah. short-term action to help passengers back right this is interesting so as the pandemic eases and the country continues to move forward through the uh, can move through the roadmap. The government is determined to work with the sector to help passengers back onto the public transport. This includes a major effort to develop rail's leisure market further and attract help attract new passengers to the railways. Um, in doing so, we can help revive our high street city centres, reinforce growth in leisure tourism sectors, yada yada yada. You know, more more flexible and sustainable travel. In line with the COVID nineteen roadmap, we'll continue to work closely with the sector on measures to enable people to have confidence to travel again. Yeah, get rid of the social distancing rules that that they're, they're not grounded in factual reality anymore, given everyone's been jabbed. This includes requiring operators to introduce flexible season tickets across the rail network. That's a euphemism. They're not. They're just car nets. But anyway, we'll get there um, to make it easier for people to commute two or three days of the week. Okay, so there we are. We're at the end of chapter two. We're getting into now. We're getting into the actual proposals. So, and it's you know twelve minutes to eight. We we got there. So uh, yeah. Oh, um, lots of chat in the chat. Uh, sorry, I'm not keeping fully on top of it, but obviously uh, there's there's a fair amount to. Uh, to keep on top of it are people getting angry at me about my union flag hating uh no there we are um so good uh there we are. don't let some random bigot steal your national identity yeah that's not an unreasonable point ldn stan uh but anyway uh so anyway right yeah i don't really i'm interested to see what that shit is, chat is but uh whatever no not everyone has been jabbed yet that's a very good point james p but um uh, the whole point is that those who haven't been jabbed are much lower risk because they're the sort of people who are less likely, okay, uh, not not necessarily, but less likely to to require ICU or, or even hospitalization as a result of coronavirus. So 
even though, and this is part of the, I'm not going to get into the discussion of it because frankly, I need Dina to be sat here next to me explaining it. But the, uh, since it's her bag of chips, as it were. But um, yeah, basically, like, okay, even if infection numbers go up with this new, new, new variants, the, the, the point is that the risk of hospitalization and, and, and the need for ice, uh, ventilators, ICU, and all this is massively reduced. So even if we see infection numbers going up, that's not really the, the, the relevant metric anymore for the impact of, of, the, of the pandemic of coronavirus in the UK. It's more about hospitalizations because that's where the pressure is. And if you have, you know, if you have pressure on hospitalizations, that increases the risk of of mortality and, and of, of people dying as a result of it rather than, um, you know, having it, having the infection, but, but kind of it not being a big deal. So, um, oh, right, chapter three, integrating the railways. I don't think we're going to get much, we're, 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 page 28, oh God, there's many, many, I think there are 122 pages in this, or is it 118, something like that. We'll see where we get to. I'll, I'll be quicker in the next one, I think, probably, possibly, maybe. We're going to run maybe to like 10 past eight, or, or, or kind of quarter past eight. I need to finish, anyway, right, anyway, okay, right, I'll stop waffling, get on with it. So, chapter three. Chapter three, integrating the railways. Um, passengers do not know who is in charge of the railways. As the network has become increasingly busy and interdependent, fragmentation and a lack of accountability have held back the sector. Yeah, yeah. So th this is a bit of chatter about uh, fragmentation. Fine, agreed. Um, over two billion a year moves between network rail and operators. 9,000 people volunteer with community rail groups. Okay, those are two kind of quite random facts. Uh, not really sure. I just mentioned community rail in, in a minute, actually, and maybe I should have an episode. In fact, definitely there's going to be a real natural episode on community rail because it's it's a broad force for good, other than the fact that it's it's people volunteering time that they ought to get paid for. Anyway, uh, decisions on tracks, trains, power and planning are all disconnected. Yeah, okay, not really sure what the random thing about people volunteering with community rail groups is doing in this on this page, but anyway, there's a nice picture of some happy staff members smiling. Uh, one of them talk, one of them network rail, it's all a happy family. Kind of this picture makes my point. It's already really been happening. No one who actually works on the front line is interested in not working with their colleagues. on the. No one in, who works in a talk is like, I don't want to work with network rail. I, I, I just want to make railways happen looking at what I do. We All of us want to work. The railway family kind of thing here. We all want to work together um, to kind of... Um, you know, we all want to work together to make the railway work well. I don't think there are many people in the rail industry at all who don't want to do more collaboration, you know. Anyway... Uh, so this is the fundamental thing about the fact that the GBR will be into right. So this is the first of the points that we're going to the bullet points. So the, there are not. I think there are about sixty of these. Uh, I think was that right? I can't remember. Yeah, I think there are about sixty. These are the numbered uh, things that are going to change, and so we can go through those at the end of of, of next week's episode um, when we kind of look at this. So, um, so they've got a, a, a kind of a box out here, which is what Great British Railways will do. Well, firstly, they'll deliver the. This is explaining what Great British. Right. In fact, number one. A new public body, Great British Railways, will run the network in the public interest. Sounds good, apart from the stupid name. Um, obviously, it should be just British Rail because that is shorter and gets rid of all the redundancies. You don't need the word ways. Everyone knows what rail is. That's why British Rail is such a good name. There is no better name that describes the railways. There is, there, can, there cannot, fundamentally cannot be. British Rail is just so quick, well understood, well recognised, blah, blah, blah. Anyway. Also, if you Google Great British Railways, you get a load of other nonsense bump. Whereas if you Google British Rail, you can... Anyway, yeah. Someone made that Googling. In fact, in fact it was Jeff, actually. It was, uh, it was Jeff Marshall who made that point. It was actually a very astute point. That Great British Railways is rubbish from an SEO perspective, if you're going to pick a name. Anyway, uh, deliver the government's priorities for rail. It's the first thing GBR will do. Develop a 30-year strategy and five-year business plans GBR will do. The 30-year strategy bit there, that's, that's important. That is having a plan. James P., you've done it in capitals and shouted and with exclamation marks. Rightly so. Um, Ella, the developer, says you can't really use British Rail due to the public perception of British Rail. Well, I, I disagree. Yes, there is a lot of junk associated. There's a lot of baggage associated with British Rail, as it were. Luggage, baggage, baggage, luggage. Oh, no, that's a, that's a, that's a 2019 white gag or something, isn't it? Anyway, um, so... But I, but I, I think you can't get away from the fact that pe that it, it, the reality is that you that there is a lot of luggage baggage that the, the the current railways have anyway. So I don't think that would make much difference, to be honest. Uh, national rail is just, I mean, national rail. Yeah, you could call it national rail. But I just think it's a bit. I just 
maybe 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 I am a flag waving you know numpty, and actually I want the word Britain in it. Maybe National Rail is is just not. The thing is, National Rail is a bit of a misnomer because National Rail suggests that there is one nation, which there isn't. There are three. Anyway, manage the railway budget. Sorry, sorry. GBR will manage the railway budget. GBR will be responsible for safe and efficient operations. Yeah. GBR will be accountable for the passenger offer. They will own stations and infrastructure. They will plan access in the public interest. They will support the rail freight market and cross-regional services. And GBR will empower its regional divisions and their local operational teams to make decisions. So this is kind of interesting because it's referring to the fact that there will be this regional structure of GBR, right? Um, so what have we got here? So, so GBR will take over roles, responsibilities. Actually, I need to even step back. It'll bring, in, bring together the whole system. GBR will bring together the whole system, perform a role for rail services similar to the one Transport for London has in the capital. Um, it will own the railways across Great Britain and run them as an integrated system to common goals set out in this white paper and in the future by ministers. Okay. Uh, it'll take over all responsibilities and people from organisations across the sector, including critical cross-industry functions currently exercised by the RDG and uh, most rail functions delivered today by the Department of Transport, including procurement of passenger services. Network Rail will be absorbed into Great British Railways. The new organisation will work closely with partners across the sector, including freight operators and suppliers, to help deliver a customer-focused rail system. Uh, existing devolved administrations and authorities across Great Britain will continue to exercise their current powers and to be democratically accountable for them. That's that's key, you know, existing devolved administrations. Um, GBR will draw up timetables and set most fares. It will not operate most trains directly, but will contract with private companies to operate them on its behalf under passenger service contracts, essentially under concessions. So this is the TFL model. This is how London Overground is operated. GBR will specify service levels and on most of the network will set fares and take the revenue risk. Um, for more details about the contracts, we'll get to chapter four. So that's the next chapter. We'll talk about that. Um, work to deliver improvements for passengers and bring in interim arrangements will start immediately. Alongside this, the government intends to introduce legislation to formally establish GBR so that it can lead the sector in the public interest and work openly and transparently with local devolved and commercial partners. So, oh, I'm so sorry about the yawn. I can't help but yawn. I'm really sorry. Anyone who hates yawns or is indeed just now hearing that yawn and is yawning down the line. Yeah, Alistair Baldwin asks an interesting question. Here's a fun one. Where will GBR be headquartered? Yeah, that's a very good point. Do you think they'll go all um, kind of uh, civil service outsourcing and set it up in Birmingham? I think it should be in Birmingham uh, or maybe York. GBR, come to York, come to York. That'd be interesting. Let's see what happens. <laughs> so what's the branding? Yeah, uh, we'll get there. So um, that's number. that was number one uh, of the of the 60 bullet points or so, but with it, this is still chapter three. Number, uh, bullet point number two. Uh, Great British Railways will be the single guiding mind and leader that the railways currently lack. Yep, they'll be responsible for and held accountable for meeting punctuality, quality, efficiency, safety, other goals set out in the white paper, the whole system, planning, operation, functions. Yep, no excuse making and blame shifting. Okay. The cottage industry of... Not, I'm not breathing properly. That's why I'm yawning. It's because I'm not breathing properly because I'm talking too much. Um, I'm about to do it again. I'm going to drink some water again. There'll be no excuse making and blame shifting. Okay, well, it's easier said than done. The cottage industry of costly commercial disputes over delay of attribution will end. Well, that, that's good. Uh, the finances will be brought together under GBR in a single organisation across track, train, and the rail estate. Well, it's not across train, is it? Because GBR won't own the trains. Hmm. It will manage cost and revenue decisions for the network. Uh, budgets pushed down to regional, even local levels through... Uh, though, as described below, there will be more commercial freedom and autonomy for operators of long-distance services as passenger numbers recover. Yeah, that's an interesting one. And it, and it makes sense that, that, that probably the most useful commercial offer is, or, or kind of the most useful, useful area to have commercial flexibility is actually not for the local and even the commuting uh, services because those are, it, it's more for the, the stuff where you're, essentially if you're competing with car, uh, you need it just to be frequent, reliable, and cost effective. It's where you're competing with air, where it's useful to bring in some of the commercial element. And, and this is where, you know, I think there's still value in the, the open access operators being able to run their services. And, and that's, I think, what they're alluding to there. So that's kind of fair enough. Uh, significant changes. United Cost and Revenue will enable GBR to take a whole system view. Yes, uh, you know, benefits of electrification might, for example, be a bit more obvious to the, to the final uh, eye, although that never worked in BR because ultimately, ultimately still Treasury is in control of it all. So that's still a problem that exists and that this won't necessarily solve. 
Costs of railways will become more transparent and visible for government, taxpayers and investors. Yeah, that's kind of true. I don't know what the reason for putting the word investors in there is other than, you know, CCHQ. Right, number three. It's eight o'clock, by the way. We've already bashed the hour through. So, uh, let's see what's going on here. Um, Birmingham and Leeds are probably fairly good bets. Yeah, thanks, Al. Alistair from the uh, Institute for Government, by the way, everyone. So, uh, yeah, pay attention to what Alistair's saying. He's got some very good insights here. Um, a key weakness of the nationalised railways, okay, and another reason why we should not simply replicate the model, was the stop-start funding. That's absolutely true. British railways depend on public funding. Well, that's, as true, that's less true for British Rail as it was now for, you know, we subsidised the railways more now than we did under British Rail, so that's kind of a bit of a bizarre sentence, but anyway. Uh, for which there are many competing claims. Well, that's always true now. This is an argument often made by proponent, by a, a, a opposition to nationalisation, illogically, frankly. The idea that, ah, but if you nationalise it, it'll be in the queue for competing with funding. It's like, it's in the queue of competing for funding now. <laughs> this wouldn't change. Wouldn't change. Um... Short-term pressures to save relatively small sums force British Rail into damage decisions. Absolutely true. That were not in its or the country's long-term interest. Also very, very true. I'm, I'm liking seeing the, the there is consideration here of, of long-term interest and long-term kind of stability. Privatisation has given the railways much more certain and stable medium-term public funding. Again, that's the same. Got five years, medium-term. Yep. Um, could we perhaps do without the Treasury? Uh, are you prodding me to say a thing so that you can tick off a... a Bingo box, yeah. But it's not going to work, Alfonso Lapolche. It's not going to work. Um, so, yeah, so they're kind of um, talking about medium term. Five year, kind of, da -da, five da -da, da -da. Um, are they going to talk about the 30 year? Did they mention it there? They're still just talking about f five year planning horizon there. They don't, they're, they're it's kind of, yeah, okay. Um, okay, well, well, we'll hopefully see what the next thing. The, the last paragraph here is interesting, though, or uh, maybe funny. The government is also determined to maintain and increase private involvement and private finance to supplement the money paid by the state, just as many other state-led organisations have, including national railways in other countries. I mean, ostensibly, fair enough, but it's been tr that's been a thing that's been trying to happen for a long time, and ultimately, the only area where it's really happened is in the in the re in the realm of the of, of trade. And correct me if I'm wrong on this, everyone. Um, anyone who's in here, particularly Alistair, of course. But um, the only place it's happened is in rolling stock procurement. And all that really is, is providing upfront capital that gets paid back multiple fold as a result of really shoddy contracts where we're paying, like ultimately that's pointless because the cheap bit of, or the, the kind of the part of, of invest of capital expenditure is the, the fact that capital expenditure is actually just fine. Do that and then reduce your daily expenditure. Whereas what you're doing there is private investment is converting, is basically going, actually, we're going to create a load of additional day-to-day -day revenue spe spend to pay for the, at least these trains. So you're actually increasing the burden on the taxpayer, ultimately, where you could be just buying the trains up front with capital expenditure that doesn't impact on the taxpayer. Um, so, yeah, I have to say, I remain deeply sceptical of that. And, and the idea that there's been any, there's ever going to be any useful private investment in infrastructures for the birds. Uh, four, there will be a national brand, and I, here we go, brand time, brand time, brand time. There will be a national brand and identity to emphasise that the railways are one connected network. The railway network should feel like a network, a coherent, consistent, clearly branded operation that gives passengers confidence in using it. Uh, most successful consumer businesses, including retailers and airlines, aim to create similar levels of consistency and brand identity. Funny that, I wonder who thought of this before. I wonder who thought of this before. Just going to wibble this around for the benefit of the audio uh, only people. I'm currently holding uh, Wallace uh, Hennings, uh, Wallagram on Twitter's uh, wonderfully reproduced corporate identity manual. Um, this thing is a work of art. I would recommend you buy it. It's wonderful. And it is probably one of the finest pieces of industrial design uh, and kind of brand design in history. Uh, very, very influential. It's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. Someday we'll do a rail natter where I just flick through it and we'll get Wallace on. In the meantime... It's quite heavy. Um, in the meantime... I suppose I'm going to just put it behind me, couldn't I? In fact, maybe I will do that. Oh, God, one hand left-handed. Uh, by the way, that's going to come down a shelf and these are going to go up so that it's in shot more. Anyway... Don't worry about that. Also, while I'm big face, what I can do is flick through here to see how many more pay. Oh my goodness, this is there's a lot. We're not going to get through all this, uh, and I might wrap it up after we've finished this brand chat because the brand chat is relevant. Anyway, so um, 
Oh, so yes. Oh, national branding. So right, this is and this is this. It's worth focusing in on this. So. Great British Railways will use updated versions of the classic Double Arrow logo. When they say updated versions, I think what they mean is um, ever so slight tweaks. Uh, it's probably worth us having an episode on the Double Arrow with Double Arrow joining us. Uh, yes. So um, when we'll get Double Arrow. Who's who's writing these? Epi- Someone write these in the Discord. What was that? There's a, an episode with Wallace on the CIM and an episode with Nick with, with Double Arrow talking about the Double Arrow. Basically, the, the double arrow had negative and positive versions originally, and those were different because there are slight different ways of, of, of viewing them, but actually that it's not necessary. The weighting is slightly... Actually, there are ways that it can be changed for the better. Uh, for example, not needing a negative and positive version, particularly in the digital realm, it's useful to be able to just flick from a white to a black or, or you know, a, a negative to a positive for, for kind of graphic uh, reasons. And so... Um, yeah, I think when they say tweaks, <clears throat> someone uh, created... Actually, Raphael, was, I, did I see Valian here? Was it you? Someone created a, a version which was like doubled it and made it all doubly. Um, it was awful. Don't do that. <laughs> Sorry if that's a mean thing to say, but no, no, it's a fant- it's the most It's the most recognizable ident in relation to railways in the world. The Dutch one is not is not far behind. Amtrak maybe, but no, the, the BR logo is... is Okay, actually, when I was getting smashed in the pub with David and Tim last night, they pointed out that the roundel probably is more recognised. But yes, fair point. The roundel is number one, but number two um, is the is the uh, CIA, the corporate identity symbol, the, the the double arrow. Anyway, so as well as the rail alphabet typeface, so that's fine. Uh, in this document, even after twenty five years of privatisation, the logo remains the most widely used and best recognised symbol of the railways after the roundel. Um, it is the standard marker on road signs. Yes, it appears on most tickets. Online, at the vast majority of stations, it'll stay in those places and increasingly appear on trains, uniforms, and publicity material too. As and when these are upgraded or replaced, there's a single unifying brand for the railways. Keeping it also avoids spending money on yet another new railway logo. Yep, all that, good stuff. Um, Right, this is a paragraph that's worth paying attention to, and then I think we will end on this. I know we've got not got through very much, but I'll we'll we'll hammer through next next episode. I won't there won't be any news next episode. We'll just unless something drastic happens. And, we'll, and, and next episode might be a little longer as well to, to fill out. But I want this first one to be um, a bit shorter and snappier. Uh, pretty sure SBB and NS copied the double arrow. Yeah, I think a, a bit, yeah. Um, so, uh, we'll, we'll get to national timetable and operations integration later. We'll, we'll get there. This is just branding. Um, people are understandably sceptical about the frequent rebranding of trains and stations carried out under the primetized system. I mean, yes, people say that, but is that is that something that bothers people? I, I need to check the National Rail Passenger Survey to see that, because I'm not so sure it is quite as big a deal as, as it made out. Although I, I, I disagree with it happening. I think it's stupid that it happens, but um, you don't need to make that as an excuse. Just say that it's pointless and wasteful and also confusing. Uh, variants to the, right, this is a key sentence. Variants to the national brand will be developed to reflect the English regions, okay, Scotland and Wales. Hmm. That's problematic to me as a sentence, for reasons we'll go into next week. While emphasising that the railway is one network serving the whole of Great Britain. So, okay, there are going to be variations. That's good. I like the idea of that. We'll, we, we, I, you, some of you might remember I did a thread playing with the, with, with the, the, the BR logo and with Rail Alphabet 2 because I got hold of it off of the back end of the stations competition website i think um uh i think they got rid of that loophole by the way so i don't think it is available anymore anyway so um yeah that that point about scotland and wales i'll dig into that that paragraph is very important i'll dig into that next week i've got slides to actually have that discussion um yes if i'd been clever i could have in fact you you know what maybe 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 so okay, right. So let me let me do something. Let me do something cl- quick and clever. Here we are. Watch this. This is this is me being uh no, nope, not that clever and quick. <laughs> so uh, I d- will I be able to no because the slides are up there and I put them on the wrong window. I can't do it. Right. Okay. So um, actually, I can do this. I can go to Big Face. Hello everyone. I'm Big Face. Only so I can do this and uh, and uh, mm, uh, oh, mm, uh, copy this into here and do this <laughs> so that I can talk about the devolution thing now because i think it's relevant uh and uh first i need to do this and also do uh also uh unhide there we go right so good oh my goodness pro moves everyone 
I, you can see my concentrated face, me using a computer on screen, on camera. Isn't that clever? Right, so uh, let's go back to small face again. Sorry about that. Uh, so that that's that sentence. Now, why do I think I want to, why do I want to pick into this? Well, if I'm going to bring the slides back, um, yeah, what about Scotland and Wales? So this, we're going to, I'm going to kind of conclude uh, now uh, the end of, of this of, of this week's bit of episode. We're going to look at the devolution thing. So so right. I am improvising. Sorry, everyone, I am improvising. And this is to no benefit of the audio-only people. So this paragraph, we just looked at it. Uh, so it's variants to the national brand will be developed to reflect the English region, Scotland and Wales, while emphasizing that railways one network serving the whole of Great Britain. That worries me. Why does it worry me? Well, it's because, as we've already talked about, Scotland and Wales already have their own proper powers, right? They already have their own proper powers. They also have, oh, indeed, they have well-established brand identities, so, you know, for example, ScotRail have a well-established brand identity. I like it. I like this ScotRail branding. You know, it's maybe not perfect. It maybe is, is, is arguably a little dated now. Maybe. The typeface isn't. I think uh, uh, Off Officina Sans uh, and indeed Serif looks really good. I, I like it. But um, more importantly, it's consistent. It's well-recognized. Um, and it doesn't need replacing. They're, okay, so... In Scotland's case, there is less integration uh, of modes. It's very much Scot ScotRail. Therefore, you could play with the branding. You could sneak the, you know, you could start using. So, for example, this is still using Officina, but using the, um, you know, using the, the double arrow. So you could do that, which I think would be okay. Um, if you went full blast and converted to Rail Alphabet, I, I don't, if you lost Officina, I don't, I'm, I don't know. I mean, ignore that. Well, not ignore. This is also would be a massive over. Westminster don't have the powers to enforce this, so this can't actually happen at the moment. And if they tried to just, you know, they they could they could change station signs in the network rail station owned stations currently, but that would just be stupid. So I, I'm actually, it might be that for the network rail owned stations, Glasgow Central uh, and Waverley, that they that they do have the GBR, you know, the 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 BR lo branding, if you like, but all the others have the ScotRail branding. That could work. Um, I don't think that would be unreasonable, but I don't think it makes sense to get rid of the ScotRail branding. Um, I, I, I just, you know, I, I think they've got an established brand. It works. Uh, but more importantly, I think a bigger deal actually is Wales. Because Wales has, so I'm just checking the chat a little bit. Um, I don't think, uh, I don't think ScotRail is going to, by the way, I don't think ScotRail is going to change from being ScotRail. It'll still be ScotRail. Anyway, uh, Wales has a very good, very, very, very good integrated transport branding plan. And part of that is the branding that you see on screen now, um, you know, the Transport for Wales logo, and that typeface, the wonderful typeface, the Cymru uh, typeface, um, that typeface is, was developed as part of a broader having a typeface for Wales for, for government, uh, which I, I know that it's not going to last forever because unfortunately things get copped around with and changed but for a few decades i hope at least that that typeface will be used because it's wonderful it's a wonderful typeface i think it i like it a lot for me it, it it's it's got the clarity that 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 um you know the, the calvert kinnear typefaces transport had you know rail alphabet had but it's also got that celtic flavor it's got that welsh flavor i, I just think it's fantastic I, I quite like the stencil style for large numbers and for I just I think it's really good. And the point is that it's part of a bigger picture to integrate across modes. So at the moment, it's really just for rail, but eventually it will cover the whole of the South Wales Metro. It will cover the South, the, the you know, the Cardiff Newport Metro. It will cover the other South Welsh Metro, the, the uh, Swansea one, and North Wales as well. The idea that that would get ripped up, to me, is uh, really problematic. I mean, not least the fact that the, the strength of devol the devolution settlement is weaker in Wales for a variety of reasons. They don't have the funding powers they should. So this would just be like a really unpleasant unilateral move to get rid of that and wasteful and and dumping all over an identity that they've established, that, that, that Wales has established itself. Um, some people don't like the lowercase d. I do like the lowercase d. So uh, there we go. Um, not only that, but it would be, uh, again, they can't do it. They're, they're not able to do it. It would be pooping, you know, basically, because the other stuff would remain part of Transport for Wales as well, you'd essentially be de-unifying transport. You'd be de-integrating it because you'd be, um, rail would have the, the you know, rail alphabet two and, and double arrow, whereas um, 
uh, yeah. Whereas all the other stuff would continue to have the the Cymru typeface and the and the brand and, and kind of this the sort of wayfinding stuff. So it just doesn't make any sense. It, and, and ultimately, this stuff, this wayfinding stuff, is an example of best practice. So the idea of erasing best practice to me is is really really problematic. So uh, there are things you could do. So so previously I did the Scotrail stuff. I said like you could keep you could shove the double arrow in but maintain Officina. Well, likewise for Wales. You could keep the Transport for Wales rail, uh, and you could just put in a little double arrow as a hint. You could just add the, a little hint here and there. The other thing is, it's not so because of because of this reasonably self contained well self contained nature of the of the kind of branded infrastructure by which I mean mostly stations. Um, it's fine for that to be well. It's it's, it's well understood. Well, uh, kind of people are familiar with that branding. It doesn't need to become double arrow to, to bring the unification in because people are kind of familiar with it. And already you've got, and I didn't actually put the images up here, stations are already are still branded with a double arrow. You know, road signs still have the double arrow. So that integration does exist still. But you could go subtle. But I think what wouldn't look good is if you went full blast and did, you know, you could, okay, you could, could do something like this, but I think this would be pooping on the party a bit and it would get rid of the, the, the kind of the T image i mean it could be that you change that t into being having an ident for each different public transport mode that could be one way to do it but you know so that that this could work but i don't think going down this route of having the the you know just rail alphabeting over over it is is a good route to go down at all actually um yes this is this is very regional railways i know where's my mask was downstairs yeah my regional railways mask that i left at home when i went down to london so anyway so that's my branding rant Anyway, the whole thing, this episode is the first of it. It's, it's, it's a, it's a two-parter. So this is to be continued. TBC. Um, thanks for sticking around. I know it's a bit long, but it's not too long. There are 150 of you watching, which is some of the highest live viewing of, of all time. It'll be tighter. I'll try and hammer through a bit quicker again next week. Um, I'm going to order myself some food as the next thing I do after this episode. But um, anyway, right. So get rid of my face. Let's move through. So... Uh, thanks to everyone who's listened to this in audio-only form. I know it's a bit weird when I'm doing PDS in audio-only form. I don't know how well it works. John, if you're listening, give me some feedback. <laughs> let me know how it is. If you if you listen in audio-only mode form, uh, let me know uh, in the in the send me a message somehow. Uh, tell me how it is. Give me pointers. Join the Discord, so on and so forth. Available on all podcasting platforms is Rail Matter. Um, do click on the like and the subscribe and the those buttons. I know I never say those and I feel sheepish saying it, but actually it does make a difference. A few more of you have subscribed uh, since I, I said last time we'd broken the 4,500 mark. So we're nearly on our way to 5,000. That'd be nice if we reach 5,000 subscribers. That'd be bonkers. 5,000 of you. would be amazing. And it's just a, it's just a, I'm just a permanent way engineer. Anyway, and then internet did hold up, Ella. Hooray! Um, uh, so, yeah, but you can also support me uh, as well as doing those nice things on the YouTubes and helping the Google work out whether these are things to watch. You can also subscribe uh, on Patreon, patreon.com slash Gareth Dennis, and support me and make things happen and give me advice that I can't not listen to and so on and so forth. Um, paypal.me slash Gareth Dennis if you want to just chuck some loose change at me. And the Discord server is at garethdennis.co.uk slash Discord, where you can get involved in the fun. Um, right, immediately after this, in about 12 minutes, uh, I'm going to be, if, if you don't care for any of this stuff and you want a total relaxation and to just sort of see me sort of grumbling on and maybe to have an informal discussion about all this stuff, uh, there's going to be an episode of the Archipelago series where I do transport fever railway building. Um, we're going to continue with that fun. Uh, so join that immediately afterwards on this episode, uh, immediately after this episode on this channel. And next week, of course, episode 64 uh 64 zoo lane we're going to be talking about the william shaps revival uh in episode two so this was what is great british railways which i think we have actually covered uh and then what the hell happens next is going to be part two is the broad theme so thank you all so much i'm going to go briefly go big face i'm going to say oh yes <laughs> oh thanks so much for your patience on that i don't know how useful that was i just went out of focus um hopefully it's useful i haven't said a huge amount in terms of my like anger or rage or or agreement but i think hopefully you can pick up in my tone of voice and the way i read things and, and hopefully i'm giving a, enough no, kind of annotation that it it's insightful or helpful and, and 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 worth kind of whizzing through um yes i haven't had any any food that's the reason why i would finish early um anyway so yes uh 29 you've had an hour and 20 minutes of this you'll 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 you, this is plenty enough i need i wanted to keep it an hour i didn't I'm going to keep the next, the next one's going to be probably about the same. I'm going to try and ugh, tighten it up. But anyway, so 
Um, all it really remains for me to do is uh, is edit this text and get rid of Dr. David, uh, Dr. Kevin Tennant's. The word doctor and then David comes immediately afterwards. Is um, is just make sure that the text is right there on this slide, which it is. Um, right. Anyway, enough of me waffling. It's been uh, it's been a pleasure to have you all. Thank you so much. Uh, you see some of you in ten minutes, and others of you I will see. Uh, I'll see you next week. It's been a genuine pleasure. Um, cheerio.